free. Mr. Bejeron's on. Don't forget the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Um, or they may want to transfer it to a so-called irrevocable trust. Um, that is a transfer to a, a trust is simply a, a, a relationship, a, a relationship between two kinds of people, a trustee and a beneficiary. The trustee is the person who is in control of the property for the benefit of certain beneficiaries. There may be some reasons why it's better to be transferring this property to the trustee like one of the children or all of the children as the trustees of an irrevocable trust in waiting out that five years. Rather than transferring it to them directly, we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. The main thing about this trust, though, it has to be irrevocable. That is, Frank and Mary cannot have the ability to take the property back, to revoke the trust and take the property back, nor can they have the ability to derive a, a, benefit, a beneficial interest, a significant beneficial interest from that trust. The other part, and the other thing that we, we, that we as it relates specifically to the campground that we're going to talk about a little, in a little bit, is this question of whether you want to do a retention of life estate by the older folks versus an actual transfer of the property and then getting a lease back from the, those folks. So there are some things that you may want to do specifically with because of the fact that you have a cottage that are different from the estate planning things that you may want to do on all of your other assets if you're Frank and Mary. So, whoops, oh no. So anyway, the second issue that a lot of people end up trying to face is how to reduce taxation. But there are really two kinds. There's estate taxation and there's um, capital gains or, or income taxation. And we're going to talk about both of them. And the reason why I want to kind of focus on this is that many people only focus when they're talking, come in to me to talk about planning. They're only talking about estate taxation. They're not talking about capital gains issues. And in many cases, the capital gains issues are the bigger issues, the ones that you really want to focus on. So, capital gains 101. What is capital gain? Um, it, when you pay income tax, you pay tax on the income that you make. If that income is derived from uh, uh, the sale of an asset which you purchased for less than you sold it for, uh, and it's a significant asset like a house or a cottage, right? then the, the income that you derive from that sale is called a capital gain, and you pay a tax on that capital gain. So before you figure out what your tax is, you have to figure out what the heck the capital gain is. So this is it. Capital gain equals adjusted sales price minus basis. What in the world does that mean? Well, adjusted sales price is your sales price minus your cost of doing the sale, the lawyer's fee, the broker, all that jazz, right? What is your basis? It's a make-believe tax term. Um, and what it is, is your purchase price, unless, or plus your, the, the value of any improvements to the property that you made, minus any depreciation. Now, I'm not going to talk about depreciation here, because I'm assuming that you folks aren't depreciating your cottages, because you're here for at least two weeks, and therefore the federal government isn't letting you do that. So I'm going to assume that in this case, basis is purchase price. And you'll recall that Frank and Mary bought this cottage for $50,000. So. At the time that they bought that cottage, for tax purposes, they each got their own basis in this property, right? And it was half of what they purchased it for. So Mary got a basis of $25,000, and Frank got a basis of $25,000 for a total basis of $50,000. If they sell the property today for $300,000, um, and if they've got no other fees, there are no lawyers, there's no broker, there's none of that jazz, they get all three thousand dollars then that's their adjusted sales price minus the fifty thousand dollar basis means that's their capital gain two hundred fifty thousand dollars what is their tax well it varies depending on what state they live in the federal tax is 23.8 percent now right it's gotten really high it went up and there's a there's a there's a I won't go there's a little Obamacare piece in there and there's a kind of a general increase so it's 23.8 percent the state rates vary and you will note there are a couple of states where I can't figure it out because Massachusetts, it turns out, is the only state that has a separate tax rate just for capital gains. Uh, all the other states, um, they basically tax capital gains the way they tax other income. And, and, and they tax it at varying marginal rates. 
so it depends on what the rest of your income is as to what your tax is, right? So here are the ranges, though. Massachusetts, I can tell you exactly that your, your tax is going to be 29.05% of the total sales price. Connecticut, it's going to vary from 26 to 30, et cetera, et cetera. New York City, wow. I didn't realize New York City had its own income tax, right? So you're paying a state tax, uh, a local tax, and a federal tax. So you may be paying as much as 36.49%. So Frank and Mary, if they sold their cottage while they were alive, uh, are going to be paying $72,000 in capital gains if they're in Massachusetts. Oh, and by the way, the relationship between Ma Massachusetts and these other states is that by virtue of this house being in your cottage, being in Massachusetts, unless you like quickly pick it up and move it to your home state before you sell, by virtue of it being here, you owe capital gains tax here. Then, and so you're going to need to file a return here and pay a capital gains tax here. Then, when you, pay, when you do your local return, your state return, to the extent that you paid a tax here, which you obviously did, right? You get a credit for that at your, in, in your own state, right? However, if you would have paid less than what you paid in Massachusetts in your home state, you don't like get a refund, right? So just by virtue of the fact that this property is in Massachusetts, as you can see in most places, you're gonna be paying $72,625, right? Because that's the Massachusetts number and then there's gonna be this adjustment. So, that's a lot of tax, right? So how can Frank and Mary avoid paying that tax? Well, if Frank dies, by virtue of Frank dying, um, a lot of this tax goes away. The reason for that is, and the, the reason is actually described in the next slide, which I realized I made a mistake on, so I'm not gonna do that slide. <laughs> When you see that next slide, just put a big X across it and put Arthur's vacation. This was just like a mistake. So when Frank dies, what happens is his tax basis in his half of the property jumps from that $25,000, which was half of the original purchase price, all the way to half of the, half of the value at the time of death, or $150,000, or $125,000, whoops, $150,000. Should be a, because the value at death was $300,000. So his basis at death would jump to $150,000. If Mary then turned around and sold the property, her basis in that property, which she would have inherited from Frank, remember, because in their estate plan, he gave everything to her, would be that $150,000 plus her original $25,000. So his basis in that property would be $175,000. If he if she then turned around and sold that property for $300,000, there would be a capital gain of the difference between her basis, which is $175,000, and the $300,000 she sold for, or $125,000. So her tax, her total tax, would end up being quite a bit less than what it would have been if Frank and Mary had, had sold the property if, if, during their lifetimes, right? So one of the ways that you avoid the capital gains tax, and it's a big tax, you saw the numbers on that tax, is simply by dying, right? So hold on to the property and just wait until you die. And then don't look at that slide. Remember, that's Arthur's vacation. And then um, if the two of them have died and the children go to sell the property, right? They will pay no capital gains tax if they sell it immediately and if it's worth $300,000 because the, the basis at the date of Mary's death will jump to the date of death value at that time and they'll pay no capital gains tax. Now, the reason why that is of some significance uh, is that it may relate to the other stuff that we were just talking about, right? So you need to understand if you are simply giving your property to your children um, in order to make sure that you, you go through the look back period and therefore don't have to worry about mass health, right? By doing that, you are giving them your tax basis. When you make a gift, you give the person who is receiving the property your tax basis in the property. So if Frank and Mary gave their cottage to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. and died the next day, and Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. then went to sell the property, they would pay a capital gains tax on the, the difference between $300,000 and $50,000 because they would have received their parents' basis in the property, $50,000, right? And you, you recall, those capital gains tax numbers are pretty big. So it was around in Massachusetts, what, $67,000. So 
that may influence what strategy Frank and Mary use in order to deal with mass health. One of the reasons for that is if they give the property but retain a life estate in the property, if they retain a life estate in the property, for tax purposes, for federal and state tax purposes, it's still theirs. They didn't give it away yet. And when they die, um, that property is going to be included in their estate for estate tax purposes, which means it's going to jump to their date of death value. And when the, when the kids go to sell the property, they're going to be able to sell it without paying a capital gain. So, they, so as parents, if you're thinking about something like this, you may decide that it's better for you instead of simply giving the property to your kids and waiting that five years because you want to do something to get through that look back period to give it to them and keep a life estate or to use this irrevo irrevocable trust that we're going to talk about a little bit later on. So that's capital gains 101. So transfer to the children, maybe, but you know, you see what the loss is. Transfer to a life estate, transfer and keep a life estate, maybe the better solution if you want to achieve both your, your, your kind of nursing home issue avoidance and also this capital gains avoidance or transfer it to an irrevocable trust. So, and by the way, I know this is a lot of information. The goal of these presentations is not to have you walking away saying, ah, I'm sure I've got the answer now, but just to have you know what the questions are and to have you realize that you need to be balancing these things out. So often people come to my office and they've already decided on what their plan is. Oh, I just want an irrevocable trust. Oh, I just want to avoid probate. I want a revocable trust. But they haven't kind of thought out how that's going to play into all these other issues. So, estate taxation 101. So, Frank and Mary, you'll recall, have an estate worth $1.2 million, including a cottage which is worth $300,000. Their estate tax when they die, if they are in Massachusetts, Right? If they live in Massachusetts, on $1.2 million will be $64,400. If they live any place else, including Rhode Island after January 1, 2015, this is one of the things that the rules keep changing. Right? Rhode Island right now, if you die today, uh, if Frank and Mary die today, their estate tax would be higher than in Massachusetts. As of January 1, it will be zero. Right? So if you, if you die any place but here, and you have an estate of, I shouldn't say any place but here. If you die in any of those states other than Massachusetts, there will be no estate tax in your own state. 